Hearing the word cult may make the hairs on your neck stand up. You might associate the term with unwavering devotion or even violence. Like in 1978, when more than 900 followers of Reverend Jim Jones died in the Jonestown Massacre. Or when Charles Manson and his devotees in the late 1960s killed nine people. But while those are more extreme examples of cults, there are varying degrees. Dr. Yanya Lalich is a professor emerita of sociology at California State University and the founder of the Center for Research on Influence and Control. She herself was a member of a radical Marxist-Leninist cult throughout all of the 1970s. New to San Francisco and looking to meet like-minded people, she didn't realize at the time what she was signing up for. I got asked to join a study group that was going to be supposedly about women and the state, the role of women in the state, state capital S. So I joined the study group in part because I was relatively new in town and I thought I'd, you know, meet people. And I was interested in the subject. I was sort of a budding feminist at the time. And I didn't know, obviously, that there was a background organization that was using these study groups as fronts for recruitment. So I eventually got recruited into the background organization. Lalich was 30 when she was roped in, and it was a slippery slope of commitment and promises from there. I pretty quickly rose up in ranks and was in the leadership circles. I was in the inner circle around the leader. You know, supposedly we were fighting for social justice and fighting against racism and sexism and classism. But in reality, everything we did was basically to aggrandize our leader, who happened to be a woman. And it was a very strict group. We made commitments to be on call 24 hours a day. We worked 18, 20-hour days, seven days a week, no vacations. We did some good work, but we also did a lot of things that I feel were destructive. And we spent a great deal of our time sitting around in circles criticizing each other, sort of based on the teachings of Chairman Mao who was the leader of China, and so that's kind of how it went. Tearing down a cult member's identity and individuality is common practice often seen in cult survivors. Lalich eventually left the group and now uses her experience to help other ex-cult members recover and break misconceptions surrounding the type of people who join cults. One of the big myths is that just stupid, weird, crazy people get into cults, and that's absolutely not true. I mean, cults really want to recruit top-rate people. They want people who can perform for the organization, who can run their businesses, who can raise money, who can lend legitimacy, who can bring in good contact. And so it's completely off base to think that it's just screwed up people or lonely people or mentally challenged people who join these groups. That's not at all the case. But what is the actual definition of a cult? Are there certain characteristics? Well, one such requirement is the presence of a singular leader or guru. A guru who's considered all-wise and virtuous, and the groups, in a sense, shifting from worship of spiritual principles to worship of the person of the guru. That's Dr. Robert J. Lifton, a renowned professor of psychiatry at Columbia University and author of Losing Reality on Cults, Cultism, and the Mindset of Political and Religious Zealotry. Lifton can't help but notice an end-of-the-world mentality present in most cults. The narrative has to do with the end of the world in the service of its spiritual renewal. And we think of that pattern, and rightly so, as present in cults and in many new religions too, but also I found to be present in political movements. While this year has felt quite apocalyptic in some ways, Lifton highlights that a doomsday mentality isn't new or unique to the U.S. Maoism and the thought reform process that I studied, Mao said at one point, If the imperialists are foolish enough to initiate a nuclear war, there will emerge a form of government that will follow our principles and will be truly more beautiful. So this was, in a way, a political version of 
the apocalyptic narrative. And so I came to see the parallels in extremist or totalistic political movements like Chinese communists and in cults or spiritually extreme movements. Lifton can't help but try and theorize why someone would be willing to sign their life away to serve an ideology or singular leader. In general, I think there is a vulnerability to cult-like behavior on the part of our species, on the part of being human, partly because of our long period of dependency. It takes us a long time as parents to bring up our children safely into adulthood. So this long dependency period is drawn upon in the dependency that followers form for the guru or leader. And then I would also mention, and this is not specifically American, again, it's universally human, we are the only animals who know that we die, and we struggle with this knowledge. And part of the struggle can take the form of the embrace of a charismatic guru who promises some form of immortality via his cult. The desire to be part of something greater than yourself is just one of the many factors at play. Professor Lalich says that sometimes the influence of family and friends are a big part of the reason someone joins a cult. Obviously, people don't know they're joining a cult. They think they're joining some kind of group or organization that appeals to them for some reason, whether it's a meditation group or self-improvement, whatever. And also, I think it's important to recognize that more than two-thirds of people who are in cults got recruited by a friend, a family member, or a co-worker. So it's typically someone you know who invites you to that first gathering, whatever it might be. Once you're at that first gathering, the other cult recruiters are there to work on you, be your best friend, you know, what we call love bombing, uh, invite you to come back to the next thing, you know. So once you take that first step, you're easy prey for the recruiters to work on to get you to come back and come back and make more commitments. And once you're in a cult, it's extremely hard to break free and separate from this all-consuming lifestyle. When you have no other reality checks, but the reality of the group, it's very difficult to question and challenge. And and as time goes on, people's critical thinking skills get more and more worn down. And so it becomes harder and harder to think about leaving or find a reason to leave. Not to mention that there's always a code of silence. And so leaving is something, if you even think about it, you pretty much figure out you have to do on your own. And that's a very difficult choice. You may be leaving behind your whole family or friends that you've made over the years that feel like your family. And you've got to give up everything you know and believe and love and sort of strike out into this world that they've more than likely made you fear. This level of control can make a person do almost anything. With this power, it would be ignorant to think that none of these groups have underlying ambitions or extremist tendencies. That movement into violence can stem from the absoluteness, the totalism, the all or none commitment of cults. If you see yourself as embracing an absolute truth in the face of lies coming from everywhere else, you can resort to any extremity to defend and promote that truth. The idea of spreading the cult's truth or vision, no matter what the consequences, has led to the death of hundreds, if not thousands, says Lifton. The groups take on the right to decide who has the right to exist and who has no such right. And that might simply result in people who are viewed as having no such right being given low positions in society But at its worst, it can mean extermination, the killing of such people because they have no such right to life. And we saw that in the People's Temple, but also in communist China and in Soviet Russia. To find out more about the history of cults and our guests Dr. Yanya Lalich and Dr. Robert J. Lifton, visit viewpointsradio.org. 
You can also find Lifton's book, Losing Reality, on cults, cultism, and the mindset of political and religious zealotry on Amazon.com. Or you can request the title to be stocked at your local bookstore. This segment was written and produced by Annie Crawl and Amira Zaveri. Our studio producer is Jason Dickey. I'm Marty Peterson. Coming up next week. So construction has become ludicrous. We don't need as much space as we're building. But what are we building towards? Then. Mostly it was my mental torture chamber. I have got to leave this. You know you've got to leave this, man. What do you know about Scientology? I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. That's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of Media Tracks Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows. And find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Viewpoints.